Great. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm Brian Wong, the founding editor-in-chief of the Oxford Political Review, and you're watching the Review's panel on the future of US-China relations. Now, the past few years of the US-China relations have been characterized by rising tensions, conflicts, and certainly misunderstandings, to say the very least, uh, deeply rooted and embedded disagreements over many fundamental issues. Some say that the era of engagement is now fully over, that the attempt on the part of America to engage China in, in both multilateral frameworks and also bring them to the liberal order has not worked, whereas others say that the need for engagement, given China and the US's different ways of looking at the world, are ever increasing, and that the room for collaboration over climate change, global public health, and all of these other international issues of importance are require us and require indeed both parties to come to the table and work together constructively. So today's question is essentially, where are we headed from here? What's the future going to look like? And what's the prognosis like? And we're very honored to be joined by a distinguished set of speakers today. First up, we have Professor Astrid Norden, the Lao Chair of Inter Chinese International Relations at the Lao China Institute at King's College London, as well as a senior fellow of the Institute for Social Futures. Next up, we have Professor Danny Kwa, the Dean of the National University of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew School of uh, Public Policy, and a Lee Kaching Professor in Economics at the same. Thirdly, we have Professor Dawe, Professor and Deputy Director of the Center for Strategic and International Security Studies at Tsinghua University. And finally, we have Ike Freeman, the author of One Belt, One Road, Chinese Power Meets the World, and a DFIL candidate at Oxford. Thank you all so much for joining us. It is our honor and pleasure to have you. So I would just like to start with the opening question then, which is, is there room for hope in US-China relations? And I'd like to invite uh, Astrid, perhaps, to start us off on this very pertinent question. Thank you very much, Brian. And thank you for inviting me to what I have no doubt will be an interesting conversation today. Uh, is there room for hope? Well, hope for what and hope for whom? I guess is is part of that question. Uh, so I like to think about that in the broader global context um, of well, what is the current state of what the Chinese leadership's doing, what the US leadership's doing, and how they're relating to one another. What does that um, leave for the rest of us? And if I start with the reasons that make me feel like I lack hope, it's about global trends that we see in both countries and I uh, would particularly think here about a kind of sharper, nastier form of nationalism and international diplomatic rhetoric that perhaps Donald Trump was the epitome of but that we also have seen in things like the wolf warrior diplomacy of, of sharp rhetoric from Chinese diplomats. So I think that we're seeing for the world a trend that is mutually reinforcing in both China and the US of a kind of harsh nationalism, racism, which is primarily directed at domestic audiences in both countries. Uh, we see mass incarceration of racialized minority populations in both of these states, and that's normalizing this state of affairs on a global level, which makes me very pessimistic. I think there's still hope, though. Uh, there's hope for both uh, the way that these states will impact the rest of the world and also for the collaboration prospects between the two. And that's particularly because of the really genuine shared interests of the leading elites in both countries. And particularly, I think, around climate change that you uh, just brought up in your opening remarks, Brian. I think it's a crystal clear case that it's in the interest of the Chinese Communist Party and its regime stability uh, to be more proactive uh, about mitigating climate change. I think this feeds into the story that is being told about you know, why you want a Chinese communist leadership uh, for the Chinese population. And I think it's equally in the very clear self-interest of um, American elites. So I'm hoping that this will be becoming increasingly clear to leaderships in both countries and, and gives me some hope that it's uh, very uh, obviously rational um, to collaborate around these issues. That does not mean it's a given that it will happen, uh, but certainly there are, I think, very strong incentives there. Uh, and those incentives 
give me uh, hope for the future for collaboration. We'll hand over to my colleagues and, and see what issues they bring to the table today. Thank you very much, Astrid, for your remarks. I, I will now invite uh, Professor Dawit to continue uh, the opening remarks today. OK. Um, again, I, I totally agree with Professor uh, noting that uh, uh, the, the question we will answer, uh, we will ask uh, when we receive this, this question is, um, hope for what and uh, hope for whom? That's the correct um, question, I think. Uh, all I think what is our expectation uh, in terms of uh, China-US relations? I think at least uh, we can have two kinds of, uh, two level of expectation. One kinds of expectation is high expectation. That is uh, maybe uh, we hope that the China-US relations can go back to to those old good days um, or, or to the engagement period. Um, if that's our expectation, I will say there's no, there's little room for that. Uh, I, I don't think the U.S.-China relations can go back to 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 the status of 10 years ago. Uh, no need to mention 20 or 30 years ago. But if our expectation is to stabilize the bilateral relations, if we want a stable and uh, and we want uh, and uh, some. Uh, it, it, some kind of relations that we can um, re more reliable. I think it's still possible. I think there are rooms that we can work. And uh, actually, this morning, uh, Beijing time, uh, President Xi Jinping and President Biden just made a phone call. This is their second phone call uh, after President Biden uh, uh, inaugurated. So I think that's a positive sign that the two sides, um, the two sides work together. And uh, President Biden, in his statement, said the uh, the two sides need to work to ensure that the competition will not evolve into a conflict. I think the two both sides have a aspiration to uh, com compete for competition without catastrophe. I think this is something both sides and the whole world hope that we can achieve. And uh, I think it's really. Uh, possible if we, so long as we uh, start to work on crisis management, CDMs, I think uh, it's possible. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Dawe. I would like to now invite Professor Denny Kwa to continue the set of opening remarks. Um, Thank you, Brian. I hope my microphone is coming across all right. I wanted to say I very much agree with what uh, Professors Astrid and, and Dawe have said. But perhaps in the interest of having a robust discussion, I might try and take a position that's a little bit different from theirs and, and completely dramatically oversimplify uh, so that you know, we will then maybe have, have more room for disagreement. Let me say that I am extremely hopeful that engagement in a positive way will break out between China and the United States. And the reason I want to make that case, the, the case that I'm going to make boils down to the following. I think that Astrid and Dawe have said uh, that there's great consensus on the urgent need for such positive cooperation and collaboration. The world faces huge global challenges. The climate crisis is just one of them. COVID is yet another. We do not want to head into a war that will damage everybody's prospects for the future. So the benefits to positive collaboration are clear. It seems to me that what we really need to understand is why there is still room for disagreement. And so let me be a little bit mischievous and suggest that actually there is no room for disagreement. And the reason that, that there are only perceptions that there are disagreement. And the reason I want to say this is I ask myself the question, which nation in the history of the world does the recent past of China most resemble? And as far as I'm concerned, there is a clear answer. The United States of America, when the U.S. itself was a developing nation. So let me take just the, the minute or half, minute and a half that I have to say why I say this. Well, first, in the 19th century, U.S. protection of intellectual property rights resembles a lot 
what America now accuses China of doing. U.S. protection of intellectual property rights explicitly included, excluded foreign ownership. And the idea was to encourage domestic creativity and innovation. Well, at the same time, America ripped off British and European ideas. So if America is going to accuse China of an inappropriate intellectual property rights regime, which is actually no longer accurate, its accusation is actually off itself. After the American Civil War, the United States experienced a devastating existential crisis. Would the new nation actually survive? It viewed threats to its whole nationhood. It viewed threats to national sovereignty. Geographic territory was sacrosanct. Nothing should ever threaten the physical integrity of the United States of America. China is in a similar position. For almost all of the 20th century, well, for almost all of its, its history, up through the early 20th century, the United States was geopolitically isolationist. The U.S. considered itself distant, different, and aloof from the global centers of power. Engagement with the rest of the world focused entirely on economics, something that we see echoed in China most recently. And from the center of gravity of the world's geopolitics in, in its history, in early U.S. history, the United States was actually viewed as backwards and retrograde on social issues and human rights. In the early 19th century, more than five decades after the United Kingdom and Western Europe had freed slaves, the America, America still ran a system of slavery. And finally, on international trade, the United States began as firmly protectionist. Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury, architect of America's early economic policy, compared America's businesses, its new business, to the established mature businesses everywhere else in the world. And Alexander Hamilton declared that competition upon equal terms was impracticable. The American Civil War of the mid 19th century that was a victory of a protectionist Republican North against a free trade Democrat South. So all of America's early history uh, exactly matches the recent past of China. Of course, China actually has 5,000 years of history that we need to be talking about at some point. But who in the world most resembles China coming into the modern era? America. America and China should realize this, fall even more in love with one another, and carry the world forwards in a grand collaboration. Uh, that's how I think that there's hope for America-China relations. Back to you, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. Thank you for that. And now, uh, last but not least, I should invite Ike to uh, uh, continue the remarks today. Thank you, Brian. And thank you to all of my co-panelists for sharing a virtual stage with me. I enjoyed and agreed with bits of all of your statements. And hopefully, I can do something to wrap them together and tee up the rest of the discussion. I remember it was five years ago this week fresh out of undergraduate, that I took my first job as a research assistant to Graham Allison, who was writing a book titled Destined for War? Question mark. Can America and China Escape the Thucydides Trap? Allison's argument was actually not the gloom and doom that it has since been characterized as. In fact, uh, it was to some dismay among the research team that the publisher insisted that he drop the question mark from the title to suggest that war between the two powers was inevitable. I think looking back at that project uh, with five years of retrospection, uh, we can see some of the alarm bells that Allison rung were actually quite right. Uh, the United States and China are the two most powerful nations on earth. The United States has occupied a hegemonic position in the global order for the better part of a century. China wishes to substantially revise that order to make place for Chinese power, Chinese institutions, Chinese values. And this sets up a fundamental opposition of interests. The lesson of history, Allison points out, is that war is not inevitable between rising powers and ruling powers. However, it tends to be much more likely 
than statesmen at the time expect. One of the things that we learned going through the case record over the last 500 years of Western history is that up until war breaks out, practitioners on both the rising and ruling power sides often believe that war is impossible because it would be so damaging to both sides. So we need to study history. We have no alternative but to study history if we want to avert, avert the worst case scenario. That said, this book has had an impact on the debate and I think it has forced both sides to think through the costs and risks of a potential conflict. I think we've seen this over the last 18 months as tensions over Taiwan have risen. When both the American and Chinese sides have tried to demonstrate resolve to the other, but the strategies on both sides remain one of deterrence. Neither side wants to fight a war because both sides believe that there would be no winning such a war. The other value of studying history is not just to understand that war may be more likely than we believe, and therefore that we have to prepare against it. It's also that some historical analogies are better than others, and some, in fact, can be deeply misleading. Uh, though I wish I could agree that the US-China rivalry today mirrors the Anglo-American rivalry of the late 19th century, I just don't think that that parallel holds. Uh, that was an unusual case. It was, in fact, the only case among the 16 we surveyed in the book where a ruling power essentially allowed itself to be transplanted by a rising power. And there were distinctive cultural, institutional, and historical reasons for that. There, were, oh, there was over a century of common history between Britain and the United States. There was a common language. There was a history of collaboration on various geopolitical issues in Europe. And there was a sense of common threat from Germany, among other powers. As Corrie Schake has demonstrated in her excellent book, Safe Passage, it was these institutional overlaps uh, that made dialogue between British and American diplomats possible. And even so, there were numerous flashpoints where the relationship could have gone another way. And Britain may have decided, particularly in the years during and immediately after the American Civil War, to intervene and try to divide the United States or obstruct its rise. So in conclusion, I don't think this is a good analogy for the present moment. I think the better analogy is the Cold War, the, particularly the period between 1945 and 1948, when the institutions that defined the rest of the Cold War had not yet been established. I think, at least that I am hopeful, that we are learning the lessons of that period. When we look at the Taiwan case, we are thinking about the Berlin airlift as an analogy. When we look at the Belt and Road Initiative, we are thinking about the Marshall Plan as an analogy. And as we think about China's role in the international system, uh, we're drawing of the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the other institutions that were set up in the late 1940s. I believe it is not too late for us to learn the lessons of that period of history and to set the stage for a new period of rivalry. I think it will be very intense, and I think it will be sustained over the course of decades. But if we learn the lessons of the early Cold War, we could, it is not too late to make U.S.-China competition historically exceptional in that there are more room for collaboration and cooperation uh, than for conflict. Thank you very much, Ike. And thank you to all of you for your wonderful introductions, whether it be Professor Norden's discussion on nationalism and wolf warrior diplomacy to uh, Darwin's discussion on the importance and imperative to stabilize relations to uh, Danny's sort of analogization and identification of similarities between America's trajectory and China's, and finally Ike's noting and drawing famously from uh, Thucydides' trap, and also Professor Ellison's insights concerning the dangers of over extrapolation into history. I want to just kick off uh, the discussion with a point that I guess Danny you, you raised just then and sort of inspired me to talk about, which is the seeming similarities between America's rise and China's rise. Now, if you go back to a lot of the accounts and literature concerning the need and importance of a constructive engagement, especially during Bill Clinton's era, and to a lesser extent, uh, I think Jimmy Carter's times, there was this 
believe that by roping China into the American-led international economic system and order, there would be a process through which China would be gradually transformed into an economy that is more open, more liberal, more democratic, per the words of the West. Now, some have said that has indeed occurred with grassroots elections, with economic modernization, with greater transparency and accountability to Chinese governance, and last but not least, an emphasis upon meritocracy. Whereas others have said that has not happened and that China's democratization has been stagnating over the years. So I just want to ask um, if any of you might have strong thoughts concerning this, especially when measuring essentially the objectives of engagement against the supposed metrics or the plurality of metrics that exist as for the ostensible success or failure of engagement. Um, would anyone have strong thoughts on this particular question? Well, well Brian, I, I don't know if I have strong or compelling thoughts, but I do have some reactions to what you say. So maybe I'll kick off the, the conversation here. Um, the story you, the, the story that you've told is a is a, is a, obviously you know an accurate and a remarkable one of a transformation of a, a billion people nation that were that began uh, relatively isolated from the rest of the world, but then was brought into the system by actually none other than the United States. The, you know, uh, Richard Nixon in 1967 had said that you know that the had remarked on how uh, you know the, the Cold War was proceeding, how it was with the Soviet Union. China was a different, large outsider. But you know, Richard Nixon's view was, I'm paraphrasing, we cannot afford to leave China forever outside the family of nations. We cannot allow the kind of antagonism to build where isolated nations then nurture their fantasies cherish their hates, uh, threaten their neighbors. There's no place on this small planet for a billion of the world's potentially most able people to live in angry isolation. And, and that launched this process that you describe of, of bringing China into the system. But then the tail end of what you say that, you know, there was the hope that after bringing China into the World Trade Organization, allowing the you know, global marketplace to evolve, that China's political system would eventually become democratic. And I suppose at some point there, no one sent China that memo. No one actually told China, oh, look, by the way, we're going to give you access to all these markets. We're going to allow you to bring hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And in return, you're going to become like us. And it is now a bit rich for the West to turn around and cudgel China over the head with this idea that China deli never delivered on that promise. Hey, you know what? The news for the West, none of emerging Asia has delivered on that promise. Uh, if that sort of liberal dream that that was going to happen, it we never got that memo. So I think that there's been a huge misunderstanding if, if this is the cause for const for concern for tension for uh, for for the Western design liberal system being unable to find a place for China within that order without fretting over how China is a revisionist power that will undermine that liberal order. There's been a huge misunderstanding, and we need to have a better conversation about this. Thank Back you, Danny. You, Thank you, Danny. And here, uh, please do. Uh, Chime in. Yeah. Astrid? Sorry. Sorry, is that me? Thank you. Yes, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think you hit the nail on the head uh, there when you uh, framed the idea of engagement as an attempt to make essentially the other become more like the self. Now, the problem of this equation, of course, is that there are all sorts of things that we don't like about ourselves. And when we kind of imagine ourselves, we think, oh, well, if someone would become like me, they'd become like me in all the ways, all the things that I like about myself. Um, all the ways in which I would like to imagine myself. So the US, uh, in this period of engagement, wanted very badly to imagine itself as liberal, as democratic, as good in the world, as leader of positive change, right? Uh, 
but it was all these all, all the opposites of that as well right it was also illiberal it was also anti-democratic it was also um kind of ravaging rampant capitalist in many ways right uh, and as Chinese colleagues often uh, like to remind it was imperialist it was revisionist right uh, it was about establishing a new and to American minds perhaps or, or, or some American minds at least better world order and improving the world according to American values according to the values held by by the elites of this particular place and that's exactly what China's doing right China has become like the US in all of those senses there is now a desire to reshape world order according to one's own values uh, I think you know in many ways this is not surprising uh, and in in looking at the effects of engagement well China did emulate a lot of things from the US, particularly in becoming a, a, a capitalist powerhouse, perhaps. But it didn't, as you say, come with um, democracy or liberalism, at least not as it was imagined by many of its liberal uh, and, and pro-democratic advocates. So I think that um, to come back to your, your opening statement about kind of uh, the hope that you see in China emulating the US and becoming more like the US, I wonder if it's also a source of pessimism, because often the things that we lash out at, the things that we dislike, the things that really trigger us into behaving in nasty ways, is when we recognise other people replicating the behaviours that we don't really like about ourselves. And so I think there are all sorts of... of um, ways in which we can read this this effect of engagement and what kind of reactions it might trigger. Thank you very much for that, Astrid. I just want to rope in uh, uh, Dawei and Ike on this, but before uh, before that, just one quick observation from me. I would actually like to offer a slight pushback against um, what both of you said concerning sort of China trying to emulate this projectionism or exporting of ideals because as i see it the china model which is a cluster of so sort of ideals espoused by the chinese model of governance are values that the chinese government in beijing have never really at least hitherto sought to actively project onto other states or countries and said this is the way that you ought to to go down a path on and that is the only way or means of legitimate governance now i do know that ike you might disagree with me on this one but i want to bring in Dawei here who can also hopefully hopefully answer the question actually in a comment section concerning um, this this belief that you know, this audience member is aggrieved that an Asian country is not allowed to become stronger and more powerful. Do you think, Dawei, that in seeking to become more powerful, China must articulate an alternative governance model? And has China done that successfully over the past few years? Uh, I, I think it's in China's uh, culture uh, that uh, we don't believe there is a universal model for governance, no matter it's in ancient China or modern China. And if we follow the modern China's history, I will say if there is a China model or if there is a ex China experience, that is to explore your own way. Of course, you follow, uh, you learn from others. We learn from the U.S., from the West, uh, how to modernize a country. But um, we call China modernization or socialism with Chinese China Chinese characteristic. Um, I think this is based in based uh, uh, in China's culture that uh, the emperor really don't want to uh, don't want to persuade the barbarian to 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 rule their, their own territory in China's way. I think they just leave the barbarian there. Okay, you just uh, pay me uh, respect, that's enough. Uh, I think today, I think uh, China believe that uh, we, we, China is not a country with a, with a religion like uh, Christianity, which believe that there is a universal value, universal path that can apply to all the countries. Uh, so uh, right, I, do, I really don't think China want to do that. And, uh, and uh, it's not in our culture. And uh, back to the uh, question of uh, engagement. Uh, 
Uh, it's very interesting that when when we talk to our American colleagues uh, about their goal, their the U.S. goal in engaging engage China, I think many of them say they never they never expected China to be a democratic country. Uh, this is not our goal. Um, uh, but I, of course, different Americans have different aspirations towards China. But I think uh, most of them believe that it will be better if China becomes a like, become a country more li uh, like the U.S. But the problem is, actually, uh, I forget it's uh, Astrid or Danny who mentioned this. Actually, I think China in past four decades moved slowly, gradually towards that direction. China made many changes, made many reforms and becomes a country um, like the US uh, to some extent, many people think um, maybe too much, but anyway, move towards that direction. Um, but of course, we uh, if you have a very high standard of the democratization or liberalism, China is not, not that kind of country. But the, I, what I want to emphasize here is why the U.S. lost its patience. In, in the past four decades, actually, the U.S. had uh, patience to wait. They think, okay, uh, I'm, I'm, it's okay that uh, we can wait for you. You can reform. You can, you can change gradually. But now why they lost the patience? I think the explanation is, my explanation is simple. I think it's power. I think China is too big and too powerful uh, for the U.S. to to tolerate in a system with a different nature of governance. Um, if the U.S. call China illiberal, I don't like that label. But if China is an illiberal country, uh, if you are a small illiberal country, it's okay. But you are such a big country, it's a powerful country, and you are illiberal. So that's something I think cannot be accepted by the by the U.S. Uh, the problem is all the countries are different. In Asia, Japan is different from the U.S. Uh, Singapore is different from the U.S. I think U.K. is different from the U.S. And of course, China is different. But you are illiberal and you are too big, too powerful. So uh, that make the engagement bankrupt, I think, in the U.S. Thank you, Dawei. And Ike, uh, just wondering if you have any thoughts on these uh, wonderful remarks so far and questions as well. I'm loving this discussion. I agree with almost everything that Professor Dawei just said. I would note, as an American, there seems to be a deep-rooted sense of denial and refusal to engage in counterfactual thinking, which continues to shape how we think about China and which I think is quite dangerous. China's wealth and power are a fact. China's population and territory are also facts. And we have reached a point in terms of bilateral economic engagement that we couldn't decouple our trading even if we want to. That I think is one of the lessons of the Trump era. And we are faced with a situation where China's uh, economic power uh, in the global system has risen so rapidly that it is out of alignment with China's political influence. And so it is only natural that China should want its political influence to catch up, whether that means a more prominent role for China within existing international institutions or a separate set of international institutions that are led by China and dominated by Chinese political values. I think the United States needs to think through its options and be serious about what the costs and benefits of each of them are. I don't think that seeking regime change as one deeply irresponsible, anonymous uh, editorial in Politico by a former government official recently argued I think this would be extremely dangerous, not only for the bilateral relationship, but frankly, for the entire world. I think that we are past the inflection points where it might have been possible to use coercive tactics to change China from within. 
The United States may have had that option in 1989. We do not have that today. And the failure of the Trump administration to force any meaningful changes in China's industrial policy, I think is proof of that. With that being the case, we need to ask ourselves some hard questions. China has a great deal of money. They have a great deal of ability to influence political outcomes around the world when they choose to. So it is not a question of making that go away. It is a question of where that would be more helpfully uh, disposed than elsewhere. One of my criticisms of the United States response to the Belt and Road Initiative is that it lacks this counterfactual thinking. Of all of the things that China could be doing with its wealth and power, helping to build roads in developing countries, helping to build power grids, other infrastructure that can deliver economic growth, that is one of the best, or shall we say, least bad things that China could be doing to its resources. And if we think about the counterfactual in which Imagine the United States could block all of these projects. Imagine the United States could force technological decoupling and push China back into a state of autarky. Is that actually an outcome that the United States would like in the long term? If that means that China becomes more technologically self-sufficient, less engaged with international institutions, if China cares less about what the rest of the world thinks about it, I don't think that these are good outcomes, which is why ultimately it's in the interest of both sides to pursue a policy of managed competition and engagement. Actually, Dan Wang's recent piece on uh, sort of the potential Sputnik moment for China sort of affirms and attests to, I think, what you said in the last um, few minutes of your remarks. And I just want to bring in, um, I, I know, uh, Aston, you've got a point to make there. I want to just highlight, I guess, a prompt for us to think about and mull over as we move on to you, Astrid, any other remarks, which is just a theme that's cropped up over the past few comments is the theme of patience. Whether it be, Astrid, your observation concerning wolf warrior diplomacy and increasingly trenchant and aggressive tone adopted by Chinese diplomats, or Dawei, your point about this feeling that the shi, the trend, or the, shall we say, the moment of the world no longer lies with the pole of America, or indeed what both you and uh, Danny and Ike mentioned just then concerning this feeling that patience is wearing thin from either the American side or the Chinese side, especially during Trump era in the past few years. I guess the question or the thought I want to leave everyone here with is why is this, this sense of patience or this overarching willingness to wait it out, this Tao Guang Yang Hui from China or this let's wait and see from America, why are these outlooks and approaches suddenly dropped or eschewed? Has it been a gradual transition or has it been a radical drop in departure? And with that, I'd like to rope in Astrid as well for your thoughts on that front set. Okay, thank you. I haven't really had time to reflect on the question you just Sorry. posed, which is an excellent, <laughs> excellent one. So I'll, I'll perhaps keep my comments on that brief. But I just wanted to, to pick up and push back a little bit against your pushback earlier about, uh, you know, a couple of colleagues have suggested that China doesn't really advocate any values that there is no universalism in China and that this is somehow in a, a kind of Chinese national character. And I would suggest that actually China's activities abroad are not devoid of values at all. I think they have a very clear agenda, but one that is articulated uh, differently to what we're used to seeing from the US. And I would suggest that a very specific kind of nationalism is a core value in that agenda. So when you say uh, China thinks that, um, you know, it should be up to each country to decide how it wants to be governed. But what you mean by each country in that case is each um, country's most powerful, often violently powerful elites, right? You don't mean uh, individuals, you don't mean communities, you mean uh, powerful, violent usurpers of power in, in a country. And pr we can see this in Afghanistan at the moment, for example, and the kind of support of, of the Taliban is, is an excellent example of this. But the Chinese are saying the Afghan people should decide for themselves. The, the you know, Afghanistan should decide for itself how it wants to be governed. Others shouldn't meddle in that. But of course, there is no neutral points where you don't have an influence if you're involved in a country. So saying um, 
we should sell we should should support the ta Taliban leadership because they were the best at, at killing other people in the country for example or best at usurping power that is a value right it is not a neutral position uh, so i i know that this tr suggestion that ch the chinese government doesn't advocate values or or universalism is is very common it's a very common claim but i actually uh, don't really buy that argument uh, useful as it may be to the Chinese government itself. Now, uh, moving on to patience, which I think I, I don't want to drop that because that was a really interesting uh, question that you raised there, I think, um, Brian. Um, I'm not sure that patience has necessarily been dropped. It's perhaps been less um, prominent and talked about in a different way way that there's a lot of bluster around at the moment and this is what we saw I think in Trump and in the, the Wolf Warriors um, but that doesn't necessarily translate into impatience outside of that specific rhetorical corner um, not, ne not by necessity and this is perhaps another reason for hope uh, for the future. Uh, but I'll, I'll stop talking about patience because I really want to hear what my colleagues have to say on that topic. Wonderful. And on that note, who else has thoughts on this particular set of questions? I'm going to try and uh, keep the discussion focused, which is difficult given the sprawling nature of the topics, which is great. Um, but with, yeah, Danny, is that a... Yeah, can I, can I address two points that have arisen from, from all four of you? Uh, and uh, one of which is the patience point, but the other is the, the values point. I find myself um, agreeing a lot with what Tao Wei has said about, you know, uh, Chinese socialism, Chinese practice, Chinese ex with Chinese characteristics. That phrasing is so misunderstood when it's translated into English and taken out of a cultural context. Because, it, 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 you know, for me, as, as I've tried to parse that, that discussion, I fall back into thinking that the way China uses that phrasing is it means, you know what, this works for us. You figure out what works for you. It's not meant to be, okay, this, you know, I've rewritten Marx. This is what it is with China's characteristics. Here, you take it. It's not that at all. It is that. Uh, and I realize all of us here, uh, you know, are conversant in Mandarin, and actually all of you probably read Mandarin much better than I can. But in my conversations with middle class Chinese, you know, with with uh, the people who, who try and interpret this, is that we, because we've we've we so much, so many of us read the X with Chinese characteristics in a way that's slightly off, we are taken with the idea. And China itself does not help. We're taken with the idea that China does want to impose its values on the rest of us. China's wolf warrior diplomacy, its aggressive negotiations, that does not help their case. So those are, I think, serious missteps. But having said all that, you know, we need to, to unpack why the West or the United States is so bothered by this. Do we think that you know, all the emerging nations out there who are taking money from China, while letting China build dams and roads, all of a sudden are going to wake up tomorrow and say, oh, of course, China is right about everything just because we've taken money from them. You know, uh, 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 the prime minister of a Carib small Caribbean nation pointed out recently, you know, who's taking the most money from China? The United States. The United States, however, does not go around thinking that, you know, just because China has given us money, our views about, you know, the free press are all of a sudden going to be overturned overnight. So we need to actually give a bit of respect to the other nations involved here. All the other nations outside of China and the United States, they have to make up their own minds. And we shouldn't think that just because the United States comes around hawking its wares or China does the same, that the 80% of the world that's not the China, not China or the United States are all just going to roll over and say, oh, of course, you're right. So let's be a little bit respectful of what other nations might themselves think, what agency they have. 
This brings me to, to my point about patience, Brian. You asked a really important question. Astrid and the others have, have uh, identified it as well. Why was there this sudden change? Why was there a lack, suddenly the idea that we can no longer wait? Especially if you buy my line, which is, it wasn't clear when the clock started in the first place. When did the clock begin that, you know, that China or other countries should become like the West? And so that really makes you think, you know, what, what do we need to unpack in the Western narrative or the American narrative that sets up China as this great big revisionist power undermining the international system? If indeed all it's about is X with Chinese characteristics, let the other nations determine their own fates and have their own agency. And one is driven to the idea that actually China has not exported communism in decades. China is more Chinese than it is communist. It doesn't really care about these ideologies. What is it that so bugs America? And one thing that you might end up on is that America is concerned about its position of preeminence in the world. And that China has reached a position that is 85% of its preeminence. That's the tipping point. That's what it will not allow. And all this talk about revisionism, undermining the international system, all that's just smoke and mirrors. What it really comes down to is the extreme realist position. Who gets to be number one in the world? That's what triggers the impatience. That's my conjecture anyway. So back to you, Brian. Thank you, Danny. I'm seeing an increasing cleavage or rift emerging here, which is essentially over sort of uh, where not China seeks export values and the kinds of regimes that China supports and bets. And I guess a very useful context that we can bring in here is one belt, uh, sorry, is Belt and Road, sorry, Belt and Road Initiative as a set of, you know, a conglomeration of initiatives, some brilliant, some not so brilliant, certainly in terms of infrastructure, aid, transformations, a human to human, and xin, uh, xiangpong, etc. All of these are manifestations and aspects of it. Now, no, Ike, you've written very extensively on it. And indeed, your book is about, uh, in this case, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative. I was wondering if you can comment perhaps on whether or not you think China, in your estimation, seeks to export a particular set of values via Belt and Road. And secondly, what you make of Astrid's comment just then concerning its picking and choosing particular regimes to back on a basis of their at least manifest might, if not the actual substantive military force and we're with all there. I think Astrid is correct that there is no such thing as neutral ground in international politics. To not take a position, not to act, is an action and a decision of its, of its own. I think surveying the last uh, eight years or so of the Belt and Road uh, over uh, on a global level, uh, transregionally, I think it's pretty clear that China is not pursuing a Soviet style policy of exporting its values or political institutions. In fact, China plays very nicely and in some cases has had better, more constructive, more um, successful collaboration with democratic counterparts than with authoritarian counterparts. You can see examples of this in Greece, in Serbia, in fact, all across Southern and Eastern Europe. And to understand why this is the case, I think we need to build on the point that Professor Paul was making earlier, which is that the United States and China may be the two biggest players in this game, but they are not the only players. And both sides need to think a lot harder about the interests, incentives, and strategies of smaller countries stuck between the two, but which see opportunities to play the superpowers off of one another to bargain for profit or for autonomy. We see examples of this in Southeast Asia, in the South Pacific, but frankly in Latin America and the Arctic too. So if we think about what this competition looks like from the perspective of a small state. I think we see lots of ways that the United States and China fearing one another uh, can be an advantage. And one of the lessons of history is that this is a very dangerous thing. 
uh, in 20th century history, look at the Cold War. There, Singapore played some role in this, but so did Egypt, so did many countries in South Asia and Latin America, deliberately played up the superpowers fear of one another in order to extract rents, extract political cooperation, to win arms sales, to win political support over local rivals. And this had the effect of dragging the superpowers into conflict in the furthest corners of the world where they had no vital national interests at stake because of this dominant bandwagoning theory that the dominoes might topple. And if we go a little further back into history and we look at the origins of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta, uh, these were two city-states diametrically opposed in what might, we may call political values, political institutions and systems, economic systems too. And for 70 odd years, Athens and Sparta found ways to avoid going to war through a series of negotiated agreements. But what ultimately forced them into war was not that either one of them chose to pull the trigger. It is that Corinth, a third party, saw an opportunity to gain and expand its own regional influence by pitting them against one another. And this is a risk that the United States and China must constantly keep in mind. I think we see in the Arctic, Russia trying to pit the two against one another to get China to invest more and engage more. But I think we can see examples of it all over the world. And if we lack a theory of third country's role in this system, we're going to set ourselves up to be very vulnerable to accidents, miscalculations, and potentially worse. I, I do want to add to that point, that, you, that very valid point you raised there, Ike, which is that I think there's some room for optimism in terms of the, uh, dare I say, the, the responsive doctrine to third powers from both US and China, in the sense that even if there's no consensus over what third powers, third countries ought to do, there is some degree of tacit consensus and agreement, as evidenced perhaps best by to some extent, the, the stalemate currently in Myanmar and Afghanistan, where admittedly, neither of which the status quo is optimal, but essentially is a sense that unlike Soviet Union back then, China is not seeking to transform Afghanistan or the military junta in Myanmar into an active battering ram against the US. Now, now some others say no, right, that China's backing of the Taliban is imbued with nefarious incentives to usurp and undermine American influence, and that China was you know, all along behind a military coup led by the Tatmadaw in Myanmar. I would suggest that these are different case studies in and of themselves, and it's important to disaggregate them. But it might also be worth exploring the potential moves from US and China in light of what's already happened so far as a way of testing out what you said just then concerning a third powers hypothesis, Ike. So I was wondering if folks here might have any thoughts, uh, Dawe um, in particular, and then others as well. Uh, I, I want to say something about the uh, very interesting topic about the value and uh, patience, like our uh, panelists uh, had uh, did. I think, yes, um, China, of course, uh, actually China, of course, we have our own value. Uh, what I want to emphasize was China does not make charge. We are, we, we are not charge. Uh, we don't make, uh, we don't dictate, we don't decide, we don't, de we don't decide which one, which set of value, which kind of model is, is good or bad. Um, uh, no matter it's Taliban uh, in, in, in Afghanistan or uh, other countries, um, it's your business. Um, China cares about the way uh, that you, you don't violate the, the international uh, law, you don't harm China's interest, and, uh, and uh, the, Af the Afghan people will choose if you lose the heart and mind of, of, of uh, Afghan people, then you will be punished sooner or later. And uh, we don't make charge uh, on, for, for instance, US domestic politics, no matter it's Trump or Biden, um, when they're right in Congress in the, in the Capitol, on the Capitol Hill, it's the business of American people. We don't make we, no comment there. So uh, actually, we have our own value. We think that, for, for instance, we think if you want to develop economy, infrastructure is very, very important. If you want your country to develop political stability is very, very important. But we don't want to impose those concepts to other, to other countries. So that's uh, we don't have the universalism. Uh, 
And uh, for the patient issue, I think uh, I think uh, no matter it's China or the West, I think we uh, we that it's a it's a long procedure, it's a long process that gradually uh, all those countries uh, lost their patients. It start at least from the 2008 financial crisis. I think after that, we can hear more and more voices, more and more discussion about, for instance, at that time, 10, more than 10 years ago, about China uh, China becomes arrogant. China's, China diplomacy has become arrogant. And then um, US want to, want to uh, and China become assertive then, right? Uh, assertive China, arrogant China, and then uh, the U.S. say we are back. The Obama administration say we are coming back to Asia, pivot, uh, uh, rebalance. Th this this is a uh, this is a, a interaction uh, between at least between China and the U.S. or between China and the the, the whole West. So we reinforce each other. And uh, the U.S. believe China is was arrogant. Then it want to show toughness. When the U.S. show toughness, China think think that uh, we are harmed. We need to be firm. So we reinforce each other. So gradually, after ten years, and now we are here. So suddenly, it looks like we suddenly lost a patient. But actually, what I want to say is actually it's a quite long process, more than ten years. Brian, can I can I come in on yeah, on, uh, of course. This? Oh, you know, f following what what Tawei said, but actually picking up on some of Ike's uh, very interesting observations about third countries and 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 your 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 pushing us, Brian. The uh, first thing I might say is that I'm, I'm glad that we're all acknowledging the the significance of third nations. I mean, I, we're all doing that now in one way or another. Uh, the you know we we have to I have to constantly remind my friends you know what we spend all our time talking about U S China relations the G two you know eighty percent of the world doesn't live in the G two eighty percent of the world is outside lives neither in the United States nor China and when we think about the world as being determined only by the engagement between these two great powers however great they are. We actually do ourselves a disservice, and we do the rest of the world a disservice. Now, I mentioned the, the very interesting Corinth case, and that's fascinating to hear you describe that. I, I Maybe I have a slightly different take on third nations, or the way we refer to it in Singapore, small states. Small states relative to the great powers. See, my impression is small states actually want peace. They, I mean, they might egg one great power on against the other to try and gain advantage. But the last thing they want to happen is for these two great powers to go at each other hammer and tongs. And the examples that I can, I can think of from the Cold War were when proxy wars were fought in other parts of the world that the two great powers, the Soviets and the United States, did not want to fully acknowledge. And it was really the agency of the great powers that brought about those proxy wars. However, it does not discount the possibility. How, you know, I would say, however, though, that I think most small states do want peace. They're like, in Southeast Asia, and I think all of you know, there's a saying that when elephants fight in the jungle, the mouse deer get trampled. We do not want to be the mouse deer when elephants are fighting. And so let me end with this mouse deer and uh, elephant uh, uh, discussion by taking it back to Thucydides, which Ike has already mentioned. Thucydides, yes, you know, his, his name has been enshrined now in this trap. But I also remember something different that Thucydides said. Thucydides also said, you know, the way the world is, the great powers, I'm paraphrasing, the great powers do what they will. The smaller powers suffer what we must. So the great powers go at it, the rest of us get trampled. But I think what we're coming around to the view is actually in the modern world, in the way the world is today, small states, third nations actually have leverage and elasticity that they need to exercise when we think about U.S.-China relations.
And unfortunately, in most conversations, they are not brought in. Our group has actually brought them in in very interesting ways. I'm very grateful for the way the conversation has gone. So I actually refer to this as the Thucydides fallacy. Thucydides got it wrong, at least in the modern 21st century. Back to you, Brian. Thank you, Danny. And Astrid and Ike, I was wondering if you might have any thoughts on this front, because I do want to throw in a span into the works, if not. But uh, just, just, uh, no? Okay. I'd rather have the spanner. Okay. So the spanner <laughs> is, we've spent a lot of time juxtaposing small states and powers against great powers. And I just want to add that perhaps um, if we look at Europe, so drawing in European Union here, which is in many ways... Um, a chaotic, a disparate, but ultimately somewhat quasi-united collective of small states, medium powers, and some might say industrial superpowers, uh, or at least very major powers in Germany, in France, and uh, before it left the EU, the UK. So I was wondering what we might think here concerning sort of both Denny's theory as well as sort of the the uh, analogies to Magada and also the other sort of aspects and dimensions of Thucydides uh, reference or analogy there. And finally, um, given that Astrid, you're in the UK right now, I thought we might begin with you because um, you might have first-hand experience and also thoughts on the entire matter. Uh... Sorry, so I didn't quite understand your question. So the is question, question is just essentially, oh, yeah, sorry. The question is just what role do we think Europe would play? Because it's a question from the audience actually concerning mediating between, getting stuck in between, uh, falling out as a result of, or indeed being a separate entity to the US in terms of relationship vis-a-vis -vis China? Gosh, um, so as you'll know, I'm, <laughs> I'm in Britain now, I'm no longer in the EU, although I, I very much like to think we're still in Europe. Um, I think in some ways, Europe has a similar problem to the US and China in that I think that Europe, for historical reasons perhaps, has the same kind of colonial logic to it in its uh, international affairs that both the US and China, I would suggest, um, have I think the uh, comments I opened with about pessimism with regards to growing nationalism um, along often racialized fault lines uh, I think are also visible in in Europe they're perhaps less pronounced here than in the US and China uh, less fundamental uh, and the EU has perhaps played a role in in um, kind of ameliorating those kinds of rhetorics a bit at a, an international or global level. Uh, but I think the same kind of trends that worry me in the US and China also uh, are visible in uh, Europe. And I think that's a cause for concern and an also a cause to think that the Europe might not be capable of playing uh, that ameliorating role. Uh, between the two. Um, I'm also not that convinced that either China or Chinese leadership or the, the American leadership care that much about Europe. Um, Europeans often like to think that they do, um, either as a kind of finger wagger or as a moral example, uh, whereas perhaps uh, both the UK and, and Europe in general uh, might think of itself as more important, more of a, a leader of the good uh, than others understand them to be. Um, there could be some, um, of course, role there for mediation if and when mediation is needed between the two. Um, but I actually think that the role of Europe might be fairly minor in, in that equation. And um, I think we're in at a moment as well where perhaps there isn't much patience with or appetite for uh, what others um, here have flagged up as some kind of kind of Western set of values, though I might not use that term uh, 
myself, but a kind of um, shift to hopefully pay more attention to um, other um, global South um, actors, countries, peoples, um, that Europe's not the only actor here. Uh, perhaps other states are better placed to play a positive role in mediating relations between um, the US and China, if indeed such mediation is to take place. Thank you very much for that um, salient observation, Astrid. And Ike, do you have any thoughts on this front as well? Um... Yes, I would just note there is a mismatch between Europe's aspirations uh, to leverage its economic power as geopolitical power and its institutional capacity. Europe is a federal project that has emerged in increments and baby steps over the course of several decades. And under current treaty rules, I find it hard to imagine that Europe could actually exercise and prosecute a coherent foreign policy. It's just not possible in any country to be today or in the past, uh, to pursue a consistent foreign policy by consensus. So if Europe wants to build the correct institutions, it needs treaty change uh, that allows qualified majorities to move forward with a foreign policy outcome. And that is bound to create problems and divisions within the bloc because there remain major disagreements between West and East, North and South, about what Europe's priorities should be. And the biggest point of division here is not actually China or the United States, it's Russia. And this historically has been one of the reasons Europe has struggled to come to a common position. So as a result of the reality that its institutions are poorly set up to engage in great power politics, I think there's a certain amount of denial in European political discourse about where US-China relations are going. Take, for example, the discussions uh, and debates in the current German election. The outcome of this election will be very important for deciding the future of Europe over the next five years and the future of the global balance of power. And yet there's almost no discussion whatsoever of the role of China and what the common European position towards China should be. And the SPD, which seems likely to take over the chancellery, hasn't even articulated what its common points of, of interest are with the United States on a transatlantic policy towards China. So as long as this is the case, I think Europe is going to be a peripheral actor. Brussels might act as a regulatory superpower, but I don't think there will be a European army or a European foreign policy in any meaningful way uh, in the foreseeable future. Thank you. And I, I guess actually what you said there could be none but better epitomised by Europe's divided stance over the Taiwan issue, where despite Lithuania's coming out to, uh, to express quite vociferously its own take on the matter, it's clear that the European Parliament and also the Commission in particular, uh, as well on top of that, has relatively conservative views concerning the status quo and prefers very much that things stay they are when it comes to the Taihai, so the Taiwan Straits as well. And I guess just to, to add on to the discussion here for us to, to ponder over, the comprehensive agreement on investment between EU and China was shelved earlier this year. Uh, there, there was a numerous so, range of explanations for that. I shan't go into too much detail here. But as we transition towards the final part of our discussion today, I was wondering, from the point of view of the economic interests of the EU and China, if this agreement were to be resuscitated and were to be defrozen, so to speak, what concrete steps do we think, if at all, could be undertaken from both sides or all sides in ameliorating tensions in that end, as well as in rekindling the ties and relationship between EU and China, even though trade actually between the two has boomed under the pandemic and hasn't been uh, undermined, if you look at the recent stats from the Chinese government. So uh, would anyone have thoughts on this front? Um, Danny, Ike, Astrid, Dawei. Uh, maybe I can say something first. Uh, as Pao Zhuan Yin Yu to throw a brick, attract a jade. <laughs> um, 
Actually, I don't. I don't have many good suggestions, but I I do think that uh, China and uh, EU uh, or Europe, not EU, uh, need to uh, increase their dialogue on strategic uh, issues. For instance, uh, Afghanistan. Let's say, and uh, in recent months, uh, I think uh, Afghanistan is uh, is the most uh, is the hottest topic in China in China's uh, IR community. So many meetings, conference every day, and the governments think a, a lot about Afghanistan. And uh, but basically, we put it in the uh, in the background of in the context of China, U.S. or of course U.S. Afghanistan or uh, South Asia. Uh, the Europe is basically absent in this discussion in China. Well, actually, uh, Europe uh, uh, is a player. Um, all European countries are players. Uh, NATO sent troops to to Afghanistan, and the European country gave many um, uh, large amount of uh, aid to Afghanistan in past uh, decade. So, uh, actually, China and the EU can have some kind of uh, strategic dialogue over those issues like Afghanistan. This is not a bilateral thing uh, we can have this strategic dialogue on the uh, on the uh, those issues that not directly linked to china and the uh, and the U european countries then we can gradually increase the mutual uh, mutual confidence and the mutual trust i think now uh, this confident this trust is uh, very low uh, after the disputes uh, you mentioned early this year um, and then actually last year. So we need to uh, start from those concrete steps like uh, dialogue on Afghanistan and, uh, and, uh, and the joint effort in post-war uh, post Afghanistan. Uh, how can we stabilize the uh, situation there? How should we provide humanitarian aid to, to the people? I think those are the concrete uh, suggestions that I would like to give. Thank you very much. Um, and would anyone else have thoughts um, on this matter? Or we can move on to uh, an, another spanner in the works. <laughs> Astrid, yep. Uh, well, to add to those um, positive suggestions, perhaps um, a, an aspect of the relationship that isn't to be neglected is the need for um, attention to the kind of rhetoric that is used between countries. Uh, who we are is shaped by uh, fundamentally the stories that we tell about ourselves and our relationship uh, to others. And increasingly, I think we see stories being told in both China and the US, where the other one is primarily useful as the baddie in the story that each um, leadership tells its own population about why they are the goodies, they are useful, uh, they are legitimate and positive leaders of a, a better world order. Um, and that's useful, you know, for, for um, maintaining power, for re regime legitimacy in either country, uh, to use the other as this kind of scare um, in that story about, uh, you know, the bad imperialist threat uh, what could uh, be worse in the world under a different leadership uh, than the own. And I think there are other ways of talking about the world that recognises the uh, mutual um, dependency, mutual implication, um, mutual co-constitution of China and the US, as well as those other states that we've already also mentioned in this equation. So perhaps... Uh, I would say that a positive move forward could be to move away from some of this really sharp, nationalist, racist, quite nasty rhetoric that we've seen in, in various corners of the world uh, growing and becoming stronger over the last decade or so uh, and moving towards a more conciliatory rhetoric. And I think um, politicians, whether elected or not, have a big responsibility in shifting that tone of debate. Can, yeah, Ryan, can, I, can I jump in? Um, yeah. 
with, with questions actually for for my fellow panelists and for yourself. Uh, I, I very much, you know, am in favor of our sort of moving the conversation in this more constructive, positive way. And uh, you know what Astrid and and others have pointed to how uh, you know the, the the lack of trust, the needing to find an other that's outside to to rail your to organize and unite your people against. I mean, part of how these things work is that, in a way, the, the, the more dysfunctional your own society, the easier it is to try and focus their attention on the enemy outside. Because that gets you away from worrying about fixing your own domestic political problems. And you focus on your foreign political problems. So I'm curious what the view is. Okay, so from where I sit, you know, the United States has gone through a really bad patch. The uh, COVID-19 had, you know, engendered death rates of up to 1,800 per million at the worst, the pre-vaccine era. Uh, average incomes of the bottom 50% have fallen. It's not just that inequality has risen, but the incomes of the poor have fallen. There's an opioid epidemic, black-white relations are abysmal, there are different social groups and cancel cultures and, and all kinds of uh, social tensions within that nation, 74 million Americans voted for Trump in the last election. That's more than voted for Barack Obama in any of Barack Obama's presidential wins. Uh, Biden has to navigate a fractured American landscape. Now, you know, following what Astrid said, it, it makes it very difficult for America to come away from needing to find an other. China is sitting out there, it is rising, it's a great power. We can all misread Graham Ellison and X work. Uh, and, and so, you know, think of China as the, the enemy. So I said, guess my question for those of us who live in the West and who want the West to become better is what can we do in the West that would rebuild that confidence and trust? And my question for Tawe is, China seems to be hanging together a lot better domestically. The middle class are unified. You know, they don't mind that Xi Jinping has made himself president for, for many more terms because they see his anti-corruption campaign as actually being something they, they sign up to. So what are the domestic tensions within China that's making China feel the need to be nationalistic in this way? Yeah, Brian, I'm sorry, I, I just jumped in and, and took over. I think this. you just out-moderated me, so I think all the panelists are grateful for your better and more competent no, moderating no, no, skills no, no, than no, mine. No, no, I, I, I'm, curious. I, I'm truly curious. I really want to know. I'm an outsider. I'm one of the 80% who doesn't live in the West or in China. I really want to know why our narratives in these different parts of the world have evolved so powerfully the way they have. So I guess on that front and on that note, actually, on a domestic front, I was wondering, Ike, if you would, uh, as the uh, the resident American on our panel, want to comment on a US and Darwin, perhaps a way of, as means of narrowing down the discussion a bit more specifically, uh, could there be an undergirding theme or element that permeates both um, President Xi's search for a more regulated and orderly society where he cracks down on the harmful uh, detritus or detriments of excessive capitalism and the nationalistic zeitgeist that we see in China and also the projections or are there no correlations between them? So maybe we'll start with Ike and then Darwin. And I think after that, we have time for the closing remarks from uh, Astrid and Danny. So this is perfect. Ike first. Well, I haven't been to China in some time, but it seems to me from uh, the Chinese friends that I speak to and the Chinese sources that I read that uh, China is looking at the situation in the United States with a combination of fascination, amusement, and pleasant surprise. Uh, they see American society falling apart at the seams, um, almost without China having to do anything. And I think that has fueled during COVID a sense of confidence about China's future uh, and a sense of trust uh, and credibility about the legitimacy of China's political model. I think perhaps this confidence has gone too far. Uh, 
American history shows that while we have been divided before, we have this remarkable ability to pick ourselves back up. Uh, we did this after our civil war. Uh, we've done it after the race riots of the 1960s. Uh, and I believe we'll do it again. Having a foreign threat to rally ourselves against will help. But I think more to the point, American society is just very open and transparent. All of our flaws we wear on our sleeve and we work our problems out before the world. And that is both to our occasional humiliation, but also to our benefit because we have an ability to adapt, to introspect, to self-criticize and to course correct. Uh, and one of the questions that I have as we enter what could be uh, the third of many Xi Jinping terms is whether China has that capacity to course correct or whether China will be entering a Brezhnev-like era of uh, institutional stagnation. Uh, look, I think it is very important, as you indicated, Professor Kwan, also as you noted, Brian, that the United States and China lack a theory of one another, um, which is accurate. I think Chinese sources think that, that I read tend to believe that Americans are resolutely committed uh, to keeping China down. And they underestimate uh, the amount of anxiety and preoccupation with domestic concerns in the United States. Frankly, most voters don't think much about China. And Americans just don't understand how the Chinese system works because China has done too good a job at presenting its political system as a monolith that Americans find it very hard to identify with Chinese people or identify with Chinese society because they don't understand that in China there actually is a very lively debate and that Chinese people, Chinese families are actually quite similar to themselves. So I think that people to people ties are very important. I think we had three and a half or so decades of a relative openness, which generated a huge amount of goodwill by creating uh, an elite class on, in both the United States and China that had some knowledge of how the other system worked, that had lived in the other country, that maybe had some knowledge of the language, that had interlocutors that they could call to help them understand uh, and decipher the official pronouncements. And I worry that during COVID, as China has taken the opportunity to tighten its borders and begin to close itself off to the world, uh, that that era of person-to-person -person engagement is ending and that this will have negative consequences for our ability to negotiate uh, a peace or manage our competition. Uh, the final point I'd make is, as a graduate student today, just looking at the difference between my peers five years ahead of me and a few years behind me, there's a huge difference in their personal experience of China. Uh, people just a few years older than I did, than, than I am, had the opportunity to study potentially for several years in mainland China to learn the language deeply, to travel around unsupervised, to, to visit rural areas, smaller cities, to meet workers, to talk to people, to learn about the character of Chinese society in a rich and human way. And people just a few years younger than me may never have the opportunity to study the Chinese language in mainland China at all and have to learn about the country entirely through books. I think this is a very dangerous long-term trend and we need to find many people. Thank you very much, Ike, for your um, observations and comments on that front. And I think, Dawe, um, it will be great to hear from you at this point, given the many uh, I think questions and observations have been raised thus far especially concerning China's domestic trends and evolution, of which I think you would have definitely uh, the best knowledge here to comment. Yeah, can, can, you, can you hear me clearly? Uh, yeah, my, yeah my, my internet access uh, seems uh, problematic. Um, I think, uh, thank you, thank uh, Danny for the interesting question. Uh, regarding China's nationalism, uh, I think uh, I think the sources the the sources of China's nationalism, there are several several kinds of sources. But I think Danny asked about domestic one. Uh, why do we need a? Uh, why do Chinese government need a nationalism? Uh, 
Um, but I think it's uh, it's not a comp it's not a, a, I think it's it's a combination of uh, external pressure and uh, internal factor. Uh, from internal factor, I think China believe that it's in a critical period, mm, uh, 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 doing very tough reform and uh, decisive measures. Like uh, I think China is in a, a quite difficult period uh, in terms of its development phase. Uh, in past four decades, um, I think the relative uh, easy part of the reform has been finished. But now China is a middle income country. How can China uh, upgrade it into a, as a, to, a, to a developed country? Can you uh, rely uh, on your own, on yourself to, to be a, um, a developed country, to have your own innovation, to have uh, climb up to the uh, along the the supply chain uh, to the uh, to the uh, high end of the uh, manufacturing manufacturing. I think those are very difficult. And of course, as you mentioned, anti-corruption, military reform, um, and we also have Taiwan issue, Hong Kong issue, Xinjiang issue. So um, I think uh, the government still feel that we need a very unified country so we can overcome uh, those difficult and we can have a top-down uh, reform uh, facing such a challenging situation. So uh, this is, I think, the domestic explanation. Uh, of course, I, as I said earlier, I, I think uh, nationalism is not always, is, is not at least, uh, uh, can uh, can uh, cannot be explained only from that angle. Of course, the interaction with uh, particularly uh, uh, the U.S., but uh, more broadly with other countries, I think um, uh, also played a role. Like uh, including our relations with the neighboring countries um, in recent years. No matter who is correct, who is wrong, this is a complicated story, but. Uh, those disputes, I will say, uh, triggered nationalism in China. Uh, yes, and uh, like uh, what uh, what Trump administration did uh, in China-U.S. relations, I think um, also accelerated the nationalism uh, in China. And uh, of course, the uh, the COVID, um, particularly uh, the situation after the first several years uh, last year china chinese people realized that uh, we did a relative uh, good job controlling the pandemic domestically that uh, i think enhanced the uh, natural pride of the people so that's also played a role in nationalism so combine this domestic uh, explanation and external or uh, international uh, explanation. I think that's the reason behind the surging nationalism in in China. Uh, I think to some part, to some extent, I think it's natural, but uh, to some extent, I think it's maybe too much um, because it's um, it's a double-edged sword. So we understand this. So I hope that uh, we can have a reasonable uh, understanding of the world. Uh, uh, I think particularly for China and the US, we don't need a threat inflation. I think both countries have kind of threat inflation towards the other side. So uh, probably we have to uh, cool down uh, our head. I mean, both China and the US. Thank you very much, uh, Dawe. And now may I invite uh, Danny or Astrid to close off uh, their respective contributions to today's uh, panel. And yeah. So maybe Astrid. we'll go with Astrid first, and then uh, yeah. Danny can have the last word, uh, having asked a very tricky question. <laughs> Thank you, I realize we're um, running out of time and it's been a really interesting panel. So I'll be very short and say that my uh, hope for the future to return to my opening remarks lies with politicians dealing with the real um, 
big important questions that require cooperation. Stop mucking about, knuckle down around uh, the climate crisis and get it sorted. Uh, I think um, keeping focused on on the real prize here is uh, would be a way to uh, fun, find common ground uh, and the real, real shared interest. Thank you very much, Astrid and Danny. Uh, thank you. Let, let me just finish up by repeating a message that that I think uh, Egg said most clearly, but I think everybody else has as well, and that is the the importance of cultural and people-to-people -people ties in going forwards from this point. Uh, Egg referred to the Americans who wanted to study in China. I was one of those who got all of my education in the United States on the Eastern Seaboard, and I even worked in the United States. Uh, but I and hundreds of thousands of Chinese students came to understand America firsthand, flaws and all, because of something that came on the tails of what Richard Nixon said. China and America reached an understanding on the exchange of students and scholars between the USA and the PRC. And this was built on Chinese scholars wanting to recreate their positive experiences in America when they were undergraduates and PhD students. And I think that, that the decades of uh, peace and prosperity, greater understanding that we've got, stemmed from this kind of people-to-people -people exchange. And we, the world today, we run the risk of losing that because we're shutting down all kinds of engagement. And I, we really need to get back to that. So, you know, we need to figure out what the world wants. America, if it con opens up again the way that it did for the 70s and 80s and 90s, it will be able to tell the rest of the world a better story it will be more convincing and resonant on what it wants to tell the rest of the world. Wanting to be the preeminent power in the world does not scan for 80% of the world outside. China, if it's able to come back into that conversation, will also realize that it has to tell a better story. It's got to stop doing the wolf warrior diplomacy and the aggressive negotiations. It's got to, we've all got to bring back the 80% of the world outside into this conversation. Because at the end of it all, we actually want the same thing. Sustainable economic prosperity, solution to the global crime, climate crisis, a fair level playing field on which all of us can ply our trade and business. And those don't, I mean, we say that there are no universal attributes. Liberal democracy is not universal, but level playing field is. So I say that we go back to fundamentals and reignite people to people and cultural exchange. Thank back you very much. Thank you, Danny. And thank you to all of you for this incredible discussion. Now, drawing this conversation to an end, it is indubitably true that the past decade, especially the past five years, have not been easy on US-China relations. From allegations concerning ostensible interference with national security, with tensions over Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and finally, to the recent escalation, indeed, in conversations over China's trade behaviors, the origins of COVID, and America's institutional and embedded racism, it is clear that there are many impediments and problems ahead. But I agree, and I'm grateful that we all converge, ultimately, I hope, on this belief that there's more per JFK, there's more that unites us then divides us, that what unites us is greater than what divides us, whether it be in our sharing common challenges that we ought to tackle, in the fact that only collaboration and cooperation as opposed to a race to the bottom could allow us to deal with climate change, public health crises, terrorism, national security threats and all that. And that fundamentally, even if we can't agree on where not democracy is or isn't the optimal model of governance, that there might be more, uh, per Danny's observations just then, that again reconciles and unites Chinese leaders and American leaders, which is a common shared recognition of the importance of everyone and their lives. And with that in mind, thank you all so much for joining us today for this incredible panel. It's been a real pleasure and thank you for tuning in for those of you who are watching at home. Uh, this is Oxford Political Review and this has been our panel on the future of US and China engagement. Thank you all.